you know, I started flying kites in 1995 on March the 11th. It was a week before my birthday. And my wife bought me a little kite and uh, she's regretted it ever since. Well, I started flying kites when I was a little child. We've grown up with kites all our lives, but um, probably when I was about 16, 17, I came down to London and went to the kite store there and uh, saw these amazing carbon fiber, ripstop nylon, colorful, you know, high-tech kites and thought I'd have a go at making one or two and I did and they worked. I've been flying kites since I was, God, childhood days, since I was probably about two or three or something like that um, and then kind of seriously so um, for competition and that kind of thing for the last 10 years. I think that lasted about a week and then I was back buying a bigger one and a better one and then a bigger one and a better one and I started flying up at Epsom Downs there's a lot of great flies up there and that was where I first had a go on a stranger. I've competed for 10 years and been retired from competition for three years now um, and won numerous events and been around the world several times so it's been a great passion. 1993 was my first competition. Uh, that was Brighton and that was an individual competition um, and I kind of got around to doing that by having my arm twisted by Carl, my brother, who um, he kind of got into it. He'd started the team that I then later joined called Aircraft. At the end of that year I met Tim Benson at the Portsmouth Kite Festival. I was flying the box of tricks by then and he offered to sponsor me. So I started flying Benson kites pretty much all the time and um, I suppose the rest is history. Evolver started when uh, James and I carried on flying from our aircraft days, which is the team that we're in. There are four of us and the team existed for five years. And then James and I got together to fly pairs and we've competed for two or three years, I can't quite remember at the moment, but um, we won all the competitions in 1999 and 2000. After that, I uh, flew in some competitions, um, but that's all a bit, uh, I mean, it's fun, but um, it gets your flying level up, your skill level up, but it's hard work as well. And, um, you know, kite flying for me is a fun thing. I certainly like quad line flying and dual line flying and single line flying, so I like every aspect of kite flying even the power kites. I've been in hospital with broken ankles from flying big foils, so, you know, I'm not, um, not exclusive to one type of kite. A lot of people have asked me, kind of, what's the secret of really high-level kind of kite flying and, you know, doing well in competitions and so forth. And to my mind, there is kind of no real secret. But I, I think the thing about it is lots of hard work and obsession, in my case, for sure, with trying to get to always trying to push myself and always trying to push what we're doing in pairs or when we did in the team as well. What we've also done is put hours and hours of work, thousands of hours work into what we do and it's by doing that that we get to just see how good we are and also by talking to other people as well. There's a lot you can learn from just really closely observing other people fly and we do that constantly. Of course if you want to enter competitions that's about a, as objective way as it gets to find out how good <laughs> you are. Hello, my name is Jim Dropshaw, this is Andy Woodley. This is Carl Robertson. Welcome to Flying Techniques. <laughs> the airbow and how to set it up. Here we have an airbow, 
fresh out of Mr. Benson's factory. This is, I think, the final prototype, the very last airboat, well, the very first production airboat, depending on how you look at it. Now, as you can see, I've flown it before, and I always keep my lines attached to the kite and shove them in the bag. That way, it's a lot easier. You get out, don't need to attach your lines. So, let's just unroll this. Got two large spreaders, and we've got four standoffs. So, make sure the lines aren't tangled around anything. And we need to find the back of the centre part here. Now, these two spreaders you need to find the green end here with the green tape. This is the part that's reinforced, and this needs to go in the middle. So, that one goes through there. And this attaches on here. And then that slots in at the wing tip. And this one slots in at the wingtip here. Then we take the standoffs, four of them. One end's got a rubber bung on, and one end hasn't. So the end that hasn't goes in the kite. Now, it's very important you put it in the kite first and not in here. Let me show you why. If you put it in this end here, and then try and force it in, it's under pressure, and if you slip, that sharp end will go straight through the kite. So always, always, put in the kite first and then slide them into the top. And these here are designed to be quite a tight fit so that it doesn't slip out while you're flying. So there we go, that's your kite set up. And as you can see, I've got my lines already attached and they're just wrapped around the handles. So all I need to do is just walk back, unwrapping my lines. The other benefit of keeping your lines attached to the kite is that they can't get twisted up and tangled. You might have a few twists, but you won't end up with any major knots. Well, most of the time. It's really a hybrid between a four-line kite and a two-line kite. I wanted to get something that channels the air in the same way that a two-line kite does, so that it carves as you fly it. And it means you can fly it with big two-hand two movement, like you would a two-line kite. But it's also got the control of a four-line kite. And it's totally symmetrical, left to right and top to bottom. So you can fly it up and down, back, side and round, whatever. It makes a very nice kite, does Tim Benson. Superb design, of course, that he had to work with. So the fact that the uh, Airbow can yo-yo is really what makes it stand out from other four-line kites, most other four-line kites. It's really designed to spin around that spot there like that. Let's see if we can do a crazy, insane <laughs> burrito wrap, roll-up, launch. Here we go. Let's just check I've got the right handles in the right hands first. Ready? Let's watch out for Mr. Bullet. Okay, this is all gonna go horribly wrong. Here we go. I think we've pulled it off. Hey! Woohoo! So, this is the airbow. We can start with the kite on the ground. Now, flying the airbow, you have these here handles. Tilt the handles back, and the kite will go up. Tilt the handles down. Hey, and guess what? The kite goes down. Now, the good thing about the airbow is that you can also fly it like a two-line kite, using big hand movements to steer it around the sky. So if you're used to flying a two-line kite or a quad-line traction kite, you'll be familiar with flying it this way. Now, when you're flying it like a two-line kite, it helps to hold the handles a little bit lower and get a full hand grip to help power the kite up. Whoa, there we go. 
And the great thing is that because we're flying on handles, we can stop it at any time. Looks very dramatic when you fly down and then stop. Now to get a really tight spin, you want to keep your handles as close together as possible and just tilt one right forwards and the other one right back. For slower spins, use more of a hand motion. Another nice move you can do with the airbow is just hovering just above the ground. Again, it shows great control of the kite. And you can also go on an edge. Roll over onto the other edge. Let the kite go right back. And there's a little axle takeoff. And another barrel roll. Let's show that motion where we've got the kite on its side and we let the bottom hand right out. We can pull it in to take the kite down to a tip stab, let it out to lift the kite up. And then you can quickly switch hands to flick it round. See, I'm using big hand movements here. Letting the bottom lines go right out to keep the kite stable. Now when it's in that sideways position, you can also fly the kite one way and fly the kite the other. And it also flies side to side. Tip stabs. Let's now try a tip drag. Now let's look at flick flacks and yo-yos. Where's the camera gone? Hello camera. We're going to do flick flacks and yo-yos now. This is a very cool trick, very, very cool trick. So if you're flying in a light wind, you can just give a little pop and start the kite rocking. But today we've got a bit too much wind to do that. So we're going to use another technique, which is to put both handles in one hand and pull down on the top lines and release. That was nice. Let's try another one. So to do the yo-yo, well to do the yo-yo in high wind, you can put both handles in one hand, pull down and grab the top lines, pull them down and then just let go. Big arm movements, there's a kill. And you can use that to go into a flick flack. Well, I can sometimes when the wind's not so heavy. There we go, there's a flick flag. Whee! That's a yo-yo there. Let's try another yo-yo. Oh, we're in a mess. Houston, we have a problem. Let's give it a little tug. There we go, we're out. There's no problem with a kite that can't be fixed with a little tug. So let's look at some axles now. One of the basic tricks of the airbow, which comes across from two line flying is the axle. And the hand motion is very similar. Um, here we're gonna look at a right hand axle and we start by pushing the right hand forwards to let that side of the kite go back. And as we do so, we pull slightly on the bottom left line. And then we just give a jab, hard pull with the top with the right hand. You push one hand forward, give some slack on the line, and then pop. 
and the kite flicks round. And here's the left hand, flying the kite mostly on the bottom right line, and then we're going to pull hard with the left hand, mostly pulling on the top line. There we go. And there's the knitting manoeuvre for doing continuous axles. <laughs> now a really impressive trick you can do with the elbow is a barrel roll. And the easiest way to start this is just to pull on one line and start the kite flying in a big loop and gradually go tighter and tighter and tighter until the kite will roll with the end towards you like so. It's very hard doing it slow, going around in a loop. So the secret when you're doing a barrel roll is to pull on the top line. So I'm just pulling on the top line here and the kite spins round. Let's see that again because I like doing barrel rolls. Ah, oh, lovely. Whee, slow. Spin. And down to a tip stab. And uh, one-handed flying. You can fly with one hand, you know. Oh. Spin. Yeah. Hmm. So I just need two now. Let's see if we can be a bit clever here. And uh, we're just walking down the lines. Looks like it's our kite. So we're going to put this away now. Handles together, lines together. So just put that through there just to tie them off. Stop it coming undone. Now to undo it, the only thing that's really tricky is getting this bit out here. So Grab it like that and pull. It's a little bit stiff, but they shouldn't come out with too much problem. And remember to always take them off the spar and then take them off the sail afterwards. Four standoffs, spreaders come out. And then you can grab one spine Grab the other, get all the bridle lines in the middle. Spars. Wrap it up, and it's ready to go back in the bag, which is over here. Kite goes back in the bag with handles. ready for next time. The thing about the airbow is that it's designed to be fun. Um, I wanted a kite that was easy to fly, you could pick up and just learn it quickly. Um, it doesn't require very precise hand movements. Um, so the best thing to do is just get out there and fly it. Just bash it about, see what it does. It's very stable, it's very recoverable. So just go out and see what you can do. Enjoy it. The Revolution was designed by two brothers, the Hadziki brothers from California, and they make, or they were making golf shafts at the time, and that's where they get the spar technology from, is producing golf shafts. When the Revolution first came out, they decided to call it, for some reason, the Neos Omega, <laughs> and um, 
fairly soon after that decided to change it to the revolution, which is obviously far easier to talk about. <laughs> now I tend to pack both sails that I use, because I use two sails and then a combination of spars. I tend to pack the two kites together and then roll the spars into the two kites, which is the way that you pack away one revolution anyway. So it comes out fairly neat and tidy. And today's a really light wind day with really kind of uneven wind, which is dropping down to almost nothing. So certainly not going to need the vented version of the kite. And then when we lay the kite out, I'm fortunate enough to have a quite a wide selection of spars to choose from, which are the genuine rev revolution spars, which is handy, which are somewhat expensive these days. But what that gives me is a choice of different weights to put into the kite. So anything from a very wide spar like this one, which I'd use in the vented kite because of the diameter of the end. There's a better end there. The diameter of the spar is very wide. Um, the wall thickness is quite thin, but the stiffness comes from the diameter of the spar. And when you compare that to what was previously a strong wind spar, completely different diameter and also the flex in the spar is completely different. So the thinner spar with the less diameter I can put a fair amount of bend although that's still quite stiff. But the difference with this one is there's much less bend in the spar. So we tend to use these in our vented Rev1 skin in a very strong wind up to maybe 25-30 miles an hour then you can still control the kite. Now all the stuff about wraps is in fact the number of layers that the spar is made up out of. So each spar is a series of sheets of carbon which is rolled up and the way to tell the difference in the revolution range of them is that the four wrap spars have revolution equipped on the sticker, the three wrap spars have ultralight on the sticker and the lightest ones they do have professional use only. Now pulling these end caps on I have a fair amount of tension in the bungees all the way around the sail. So from these tips to the wing tips here, they're fairly tight. And what that does is, with the sail under more tension, it gives the kite kind of more grip in the sky. And what I mean by that is tighter control. What I'm gonna do this time is to put a tiny overhand loop in the end of the loop on the end of the line. When it comes time to take the line off, there's actually something you can purchase on. On my lines, most people with sleeving would probably use, say, a black piece of sleeving for the bottom lines and a white piece of sleeving for the top lines. I just put a tiny black mark on there. So when I actually come to launch the kite, what I'm going to do is try a little kind of trick which I do when I'm flying by myself, which is to actually pull the kite upwards from this position, so a kind of dead position into an upside down kind of leading edge into the ground launching position. Okay, now the movement for this manoeuvre will be something like putting full reverse on, which is pushing the thumbs forwards and pulling back really sharply. Now in theory, what that does when that happens is with the pull back, it pulls the kite into the ground and then with full reverse on, hopefully it pulls the two wings up um, and then obviously from there you're in a position where the kite will actually fly. Um, but it can be tricky and can take a couple of goes. So here we go. And hey presto, first time. A couple of points on the handles. On the tops of my handles here, I've attached some cords um, with knots on, which is very, very simple. Um, and it can be done with some kind of adjustable knot. This is a really simple way of doing it, so I can then for change the position of the line on the handle. And at the moment, it's on full forwards at the top on both sides, and then on the bottom, it's on the furthest out. Also with the handles, what I've done is bend them literally out this section. You put your handles together and you just bend them out on the ground and make sure they're the same kind of angle, and that'll give you more leverage. So there we go. The lines are all clear and ready to fly.
We're now flying a slow rotation with the kite, which is the kite staying on the same point, but actually rotating constantly around its center point. When you're actually trying to fly this maneuver, a really good idea is to focus your attention, so focus your eye line on the center of the kite. Um, and also try and, if there's anything in the sky or there's some trees behind, try and fix the center of the kite on a specific point in the background. So to actually get a continuous rotation, it's a kind of smooth movement of the hands like this all the time, pushing forwards on the handle that's controlling the bottom of the kite as you see it. And my hands are twisting the handles and then I'm pushing the bottom, as it appears to me, part of the kite as it comes around. So there's this constant movement. The clock, as it's known, is a series of fast 90 degree turns. So the kite rotates very quickly and very precisely in the sky through 90 degrees and then stops dead. The way this is done is with a very fast hand movement, which involves twisting the handles to make the kite rotate. So one thumb gets pushed forwards and one thumb gets pushed back. So to do that, I really exaggerate the hand movement, the twist of the hands, so it's forcing the kite to come round. It's so fast that as soon as you start the manoeuvre, you're stopping the manoeuvre, which sounds strange, but that's the way it works. So you literally rip the kite into it and then equalise the kite and kill it in the next position. So it looks at speed like that. And the critical thing when you're flying the manoeuvre is your hand speed. Um, when you're executing it, your hands need to move really fast and there's no way around that. One thing I tend to do, which I've noticed, is that rather than keep my hands in front of me all the time, when the wind drops slightly, I move my hands out to my sides as I flick the kite round, and that gets more purchase and a more dramatic movement on the kite. Because I run out of room and I kind of punch myself in the chest if I don't put it, put my hands to the side. Flying a precision square with the revolution combines a 90 degree turn on each corner of the square with four straight lines. Now, flying a straight line with a four-line kite is easier than it sounds because you've got you know, the ability to influence the kite in any flight in any direction. Then you actually need lots of control to be able to fly in a dead straight line. And to do this, you need constant adjustment on the handles. So I fly a straight line along, I do a fairly slow one now, and I'm constantly doing tiny little adjustments um, to make the kite appear as if it's going in a perfect straight line, which, of course, it is, but it doesn't feel that way um, because you're doing lots of tweaks. What tends to happen when you fly the kite in a straight line, or try to, is that it slides up or down the window. So you need to compensate for that by sliding your hands like this quite delicately to just influence the kite a bit to come down or up and keep it balanced as it goes across the window. Then a flick turn, which is a quarter of that clock manoeuvre, to change the orientation of the kite. Also, I forgot to mention that I'm stopping the kite at the corner, apply a bit of brake to stop the kite dead, then flick the turn, then pull it up in that kind of rhythm. But again, a little tweaks and balances in this respect are necessary. Backwards flying. This is something that's grown on me and is extremely addictive. Something that's probably easier with a four-line kite this kind of size because it travels more slowly and is more precisely controllable in the sky. And at the moment, at this wind speed, there's a, only the tiniest amount of reverse, which is actually making the kite travel, the slightest tweak and, and the kite stops. So it's just a tiny amount. It's sometimes necessary to walk forwards as you come down on the edge of the window or indeed go up on the edge of the window because too much reverse and you risk pulling in a wing. A lot of people are really impressed with playing with the crowd and landing on hands and things like this, those kind of tricks that people who fly revolution sometimes do. Most of that is based on keeping the kite still and making very small adjustments. But the accuracy involved is basically done by, if you land the kite just in front of someone or you touch them, or you get any kind of reference for how close the kite is to something. Say you're in front of someone, you watch where they look 
at the kite and you can tell by the angle they're looking at it how far away they are or which side of them you are and so on then you just need to make a few footsteps forwards maybe one footstep forwards and you know that when you come down again as long as you don't move your feet the kite will be right on top of them so you can work out where the kite is in relation to the target of whatever it is you're doing and then as long as you keep your feet still the kite obviously won't really deviate much what I'm going to do now is fly the kite over to the left-hand edge of the window as I see it. And as it gets closer to the edge and the wind drops out, the kite is, the leading edge of the kite is vertical virtually. So as it comes nearer to the edge, my top hand, my right hand comes further and further back to put the kite into more and more extreme angle. So the kite is there going to touch the ground, but if I hold it there, it'll lift back off again and just basically hang at a very acute angle in the sky um, with almost no tension on the lines and that's one way of flying in very light wind. But this I find is also a good technique for when you need to make ground forwards in one motion. Right, I'm going to fly a few axles which involves putting the kite on quite an extreme angle so it actually rotates and goes a bit flat so it enables the kite to spin on a different axis just the same as a two-line kite really but it's a tiny bit more complicated because of the four lines. So the hand movement is a case of putting lots of reverse and then quite a sharp tug on the same handle whilst then giving lots and lots of slack on the other handle. So I'm biased because I'm right-handed to doing the flick part of the manoeuvre with my right hand, so that's what I tend to do. And I also tend to get the kite rotating in the direction that I want to axle it in before I actually try the axle, which gives the kite some momentum in the rotation. So here we go, I'm going to rotate the kite once, and then here comes the axle there. I'll try that one more time. So we come in, we get a rotation to set the momentum, pick our point, flick the wrist, push the other hand, and then recover it like that. It always looks quite nice, I find, if you can, to recover it to a dead stop position. When the wind picks up, you really need to move forwards because just the same as a two-line kite, you need to kill the kite and get all the wind out of the sail. So a good way to practice, if you've got the option, is to put heavyweight spars in the kite so you make the kite overweight for the, for the wind that you're flying in. And that helps with the momentum when the kite rotates and it also helps you knock all the air out. I'm going to fly a dead stop. So fly the kite down towards the ground really fast and then stop it dead a couple of inches just above the ground as long as it all goes well. Which involves, in my case up here, holding the kite at the top of the window, which is kind of upside down and with the leading edge parallel to the ground and then accelerating it from there down to just above the ground and then applying the brake, so putting my thumbs forward just the right amount to stop the kite dead. And so here we go, loads of acceleration flick the brakes and that was quite good in that the ideal is that the kite stops dead and stays put and stays stable and it's all about the balance of how much or how little reverse you put on to stop the kite. So I'm going to try another one now, loads of pull and then stop it dead which again was not too bad but a bit of wobble on the bottom and then from there you can build it into other manoeuvres so a good one from there is to then slide the kite off and do a parallel slide to the ground. OK, so what I'm going to attempt to do now is um, pull the kite down from the very top of the window. Both handles go into one hand, you pull the top two lines, and you try and catch the kite. Like that, which is very good, thank you very much. And then, it's a bit difficult on lines this long, because this whole business is easier on short lines. You can throw the kite out away again. And what you can do is put your finger either behind this knock here to get some purchase, and you throw the kite out downwind, but with the leading edge on a slight angle. And you can also throw the kite out with the fingertip around the very end cap there. Okay. 
There's a manoeuvre you can do with the Revolution, which is kind of like a flick flag, which is similar to a two-line kite, as in the, you see the back of the kite and then the normal, the front of the kite again. And the way you do that is if you imagine the, on my hand, the top is the leading edge, so the kite's sort of balancing the right way up. With a sharp jerk of the handles with lots of reverse, it pulls the two flaps up like this, and you then see the back of the kite. And then with another sharp jerk, you pull, which is like this, so you pull the back lines really hard. You pull the flaps down enough, and as soon as they get past um, horizontal, then the wind does the rest, and the, and the two flaps kind of smack back. So in order to do the flip manoeuvre, you need to add some extensions and move the bridle point so it's actually about here. So when you look down, it's outside and closer to the tip from the tip that actually comes up like this. And once you've done that, then when you do that jerky manoeuvre, then the tips will flip up and they will come back down again. It's actually an easier one to do on a smaller kite, so on a Rev 1.5 it'll be more successful than on a full-size Rev 1, but it's certainly possible to do it. The consequence of doing that is that the leading edge bends a lot because the two top points are further away. Then in turn, to compensate for this, a lot of people put a stiffer leading edge in, which means that there's not so much bend, it keeps the kite flat, but it adds weight. So it's, it's a lot of, in my opinion, it's a lot of extras and it's a lot of compromise to the standard flying of the kite to get one trick out of the kite. And I've tried it and then gone back to just the standard setup. But there are lots of flyers who use it and use it to very good effect in routines and competition routines and demonstrations and so on, especially with music because it's such a dramatic manoeuvre. Packing the kite away, each pair of lines locks heads together. So a top and a bottom go together and then just finish off winding it in. And this is where you get a couple of wraps, probably right at the end when you unwind it. As long as that's tight, then you've got something to put round it. Firstly, take out the back spars, and that's always by um, pulling the point of the tip, like that. And then leaving the leading edge in the kite get a bit of slack by pulling the bungee and then just disconnect that joint, same on the end. So like that and then lay that on top and then spars over the top and then as neatly as possible kind of keeping everything fairly tight and together. Oops, he says, wrap everything up. Bit of a pig's ear at this one, but doesn't really matter. And then, grab me lines. Oh. That's it, put the kettle on. So here we are at a kite festival. It's a very hot day and there's no wind. So I'm going to make some lines to fly an ultralight kite, some nice short lines. So I thought I'd show you how I'm going to do that. So we need some line. We need a pen, preferably an inky pen, some scissors, ground stake, cigarette lighter, and some water because it's very hot today. So we're going to start with one end of the line and we're going to make a loop. So fold the line over and then just tie an overhand loop in it. You can wrap it around twice if you like. That stops it from slipping. Pull it tight and then it's a good idea to put a second loop in, second knot in as well. Push that down tight. That's going nowhere. So then we'll stick that down <clears throat> on the ground stake, like so. Take a pen, pop that in there, and then we're going to go for a walk. 
So I think we'll probably make about 20 foot lines, perhaps. That looks about right. So we'll go about twice as far. Yeah, that looks good. So now we go back. Let's just check the length. Yeah, that looks good. So we now need to cut this off here. We've doubled up the lines because of course we need two lines. Cut that off. And then you can use the lighter just to seal the end so it doesn't fray. And we make another loop. There we go. So that one goes on the peg as well. Then we need the pen, the scissors, and the lighter. And we go for a walk again. Now the secret with your flying lines is to make sure they're exactly the right length. And this is the way you do it. Pull it nice and tight. If they're not pre-stretched lines, it's a good idea just to give them a little stretch there, just so they can bed in. And then taking your pen, you want to mark, oh, about that much down there. And this is why you need an inky pen, because the ink will soak in and make a good mark on the lines. There we go. Then with our scissors, cut at the halfway line, seal the ends, and now we've got marks where we can fold them create our second set of loops on the other end of the line. It's not bad, a little bit out, but that'll do. and a stop or not. Now the last adjustment you can do is check that they're the right length. Now when you take these on, put these on the kite and take them off again, a handy tip is to put a little tag on the end like so. Now when you put that on a kite, you've got a little tagger to pull it off again. And the other advantage is that you can fine tune the exact position of the knot to make sure they're exactly the same length. There we go, all done. So now we need some handles and a kite and we can go fly. So what I've just done there is Lark's headed the lines onto the, the handles. I'm using these HQ straps, which I like. Bit of string there. And these slip over your fingers, like so. And this is particularly good for indoor flying and actually for all kind of trick flying because um, I'm always dropping my handles. But like this, you can't. So now we're gonna set the kite up. Here we've got an ultralight Gemini. Take it out of the bag, and we should have three spars. So here we go, the first thing to do is we put those spars down and connect the leading edges. Slot that in, and push the nose down on the ground. Go. And the other wing. Nose down on the ground. There we 
go. So, top spreader. Goes in the top sockets. And then we take the spars here, make sure the bridle and the standoffs are clear. And then we feed one through this way from the inside out. And we feed this one through. And then we connect them in the middle. Centre stand off on, and we work outwards from the middle. So the Gemini, the idea behind that really is that um, by putting two spines on, you get this channel in the middle. And on a normal kite with just one spine, the air pressure is divided into two wings. By putting a channel in the middle, you get some extra drive in the middle, and that's totally neutral. So when the kite's flying forwards and you've got a lot of apparent wind or virtual wind flying across it, it's stable and it tracks well. But then when the kite stops and you've mostly got the real wind blowing on it, then the rounded leading edges uh, tend to make it more spinny and so we're going to back spins and axles and so on. So it kind of gets the, uh, the best of both worlds. You've got something that's stable at high speed um, but very spinny and uh, trickable at low speed. So the good things about this bridle, the first thing is it's really easy to tune and design because you start with a standard static three-point bridle, get that working, add an activator here, get that working, and then add your cross activator. This activator here changes the pitch adjustment of the kite. So it allows the angle of attack of the kite to change as the wind changes. So as you move out towards the edge of the window, the nose is pulled in, giving you a bit more power. But as you're going across the center of the window, it'll just nose back a bit and give you a slightly slower speed and a bit more pull but more control. The line across the middle transfers tension between the two flying lines. So like this, they're both pulled in slightly, so you get a nice solid track when you're going in a straight line. And as you start to pull on one line, this line here gives, the toe point moves further out and you get a nicer turn. It also works in backspins as well. When the lines are hanging over the kite, it allows this just to slide slightly further out and you get a better backspin. So that's the active crossover bridle. One of the things that really started the trick scene going in the UK, particularly, was the video that came with The Stranger, because it really showed a whole new way of flying. It was about doing tricks and putting different moves together, rather than the more traditional sort of flying around and flying squares and figures in the sky. People had been flying kites for quite a long time before then, and tricks were starting to emerge. Uh, things like stalls and stabs uh, and of course there was the axle and the axle was really the trick that started it all off. The easiest way to learn the axle is to fly the kite right out to the edge, let the kite just stop itself, hold it steady and then push forward with one hand and this allows the kite to drop down so you then tug it and get the kite to spin around on the spot. After you've tugged the kite you need to make sure there's lots of slack so the kite's free to spin around. And then get a bit more adventurous and try a stall and an axle. And you can axle the bottom wing and the top wing. It's important to learn tricks with both hands, so take it out to the left and pop it with your right hand, then take it out to the right and pop it with your left hand. And also get used to flying in the middle of the window, doing it in strong wind, in light wind, as much variation as possible. So axle is quite good for changing direction as well. So a little axle with a top wing, you can fly back the other way. And also use it as a little punctuation if you're flying to music. And axle takeoffs, axle straight off the ground. So it helps if you angle the kite towards you slightly. I'm just going to pop this line here. And the left hand.
Another variation of the, the basic axle is to do multiple axles. And the secret here is to use your first hand to pop it over and then use your other hand just to take up the slack in the kite and give it that extra little push to keep it spinning. So you pop, pull up the slack, pop, pull up the slack. And it's the same move for the continuous axle as it is for the multiple axle. Pop and feed, pop and feed. After the axle, the next trick to learn really is the flat spin. And it's very similar to the axle in that the kite flattens out and spins on the spot. But the key difference is how you get into the move. With an axle, you start with the kite facing upwards and you let the nose drop down towards you before you spin it. With a flat spin, you fly the kite right down towards the ground and at the last minute, you throw your hands forward to flatten it out. As the kite is then flattened out with the nose away from you, you pop on one line to spin the kite round. So flat spins out the edge, come down, pop it around really slowly. That's the nice thing about doing it out at the edge of the window. Look how slowly that just drifts round. And then we take it down to the middle of the window. Got to do things faster. Cascade is a sequence of axles, left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand and the kite gradually comes down the wind window. A more advanced technique for the cascade is to pop with one hand and then use your other hand to lift the kite back up into position. So you pop with your right, lift with your left, pop with your left, lift with your right. And doing this helps you to control the speed of the kite as it goes down. And the more you pop and the more you pull up the slack, the slower the kite will go. And eventually you can turn this into a fountain where instead of coming down, the kite actually goes up with the axles. So let's talk about flick flax. You start with the kite flying down like you would for a flat spin, flare the kite out, and then you pop both hands to pull it back up into what we call the fade position. And from here, you can take it into a flick flack, where you flare it out, pop it back up, and out, and pop it back out. Or you can go into the backspin. So with the backspin, it's a little bit like the axle. Give a little bit of slack on one line just to angle the kite, and then tug to start it spinning. Flick flack. Back spin and land. There's a flick flack. Going into a back spin. Coming out to a landing. So when you've got the flick flack, of course, you can just extend the kite and let it wrap all the way around. And that's how you get into a yo-yo. You know, they go forwards and wrap it round and then wrap the kite back out of the lines again. When you've got a few basic tricks down, like the backspin, the flick flack, um, the axle and so on, you can start putting them together into combinations. For example, you could start with the flick flack, bring the kite up into a fade, do half a backspin, pop it over, Lazy Susan, back round into a fade. And that particular combination is called a Jacob's Ladder. And there's all sorts of things like that where just taking a few simple small bits, you put them together to make something bigger. I think the difference for me between trick flying and freestyle flying is about the way you do it. Trick flying is really about doing a particular trick. A flat spin, a flick flack, a back spin, with freestyle flying, the focus is more on taking these individual tricks and putting them together to actually make a routine, something that flows together, um, where you've got combinations of tricks, not just individual tricks by themselves. I always think the best kind of flying is when it just comes naturally, when you stop thinking about what you're doing. And you just let the wind 
and the kites and the moments unfold, I think you also have to let go and relinquish control a bit and let the kite have its say. And it's important to feel the kite through the lines, not just watch it, but feel the tension and get to understand how the kite behaves in all sorts of different wind conditions in like different positions. And you really just get that by trying things out, experimenting and getting to understand the kite. And then when you understand it, you can do pretty much any trick with it. It's just a question of dreaming them up and then working out how to get the kite to do it. It's also very important to remember to breathe. All your best flying happens when you're totally relaxed. And just letting it come out naturally. And you often see this with people in competition. As soon as the music starts, they freeze. They get really tense. And the hardest thing is being able just to relax and fly as well as you can. Not think about the crowd or the music or the judges or the cameraman. And just do your own thing. Just put in whatever tricks you like. It's whatever. That's what freestyle is really about. Freedom. But doing it with style. And enjoying yourself as well. The important thing is to go out and as soon as you can do something, explore it. You know, see what else you can do with it. Um, you know, try it with your other hand, try it on a different part of the window. Because really it's this exploring that's fun. That's how you come up with new tricks and new combinations. And that's really what it's about. Oh! <laughs> it's the first line I've broken in. Years. Game over. If you're using short lines, a good tip is uh, just to wrap the lines around the handles. So put them together. Wrap them around a few times like that. And then you can either leave them in the bag with the kite or just pull your little tags. Take them off. Now the only thing is when you take when you unwind them again, make sure you unwind them off this end. If you turn them around and do it that way, <laughs> big trouble. So there we go. There you go, in your pocket. No winder. Taking the kite down, pop, 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 pop. Now when you put it back in the bag, for short periods you can leave the bungee attached. However, over time it does stretch the sail. So it's a good idea to use the top spreader. Don't use one of the expensive, fragile, wrapped ones. But use a top spreader just to take the leech line off. Not the leech line, the bungee line. And then, if you want to put it back in the bag like that, don't need to take the wings down. Spars go there. Wrap it up and back in the bag, wherever that is. Once you've got your nice new kite and you've got the lines and the straps to go with it to fly it on, you might want some spares. Good useful things to keep in the bag, things like spare spars, ferrules, in case you get a breakage and you can glue them back in, spare rubber bands or bungee, super glue, PVC tape, and repair tape, clear repair tape is the best, sleeving needle, and then a ground stake. Now the wind's about, um, I would guess at 
five miles an hour, round about that kind of wind speed. It's not very strong, so I'm going to fly an ultralight matrix. And we could have anything from three to five kites for different wind ranges. And going anything from the super ultralight kite, which would be very, very lightweight, almost an indoor kite, through an ultralight to standard, to a vented, to a super vented, which would be for very strong wind. But this is an ultralight, so I'm going to fly this in winds from around two, three miles an hour up to about 10 to 12 miles an hour. And if the wind's very bumpy and gusty, I'll probably fly a lighter kite than a, than a heavier kite, but I'll fly it on a thicker, stronger line just to slow the kite down when the wind does pick up. So what I've done already is put the top spar in the top cross spreader, and I'm gonna put the bottom cross spreaders in the T piece first just making sure that the bridle's clear. Sometimes the spars can get loose in the fittings, either because they're old or they're not quite the right size. A simple remedy for this is to add a bit of tape around the stopper or around the fitting and then tightly around the spar. Most people lose their standoffs when they're flying. The best thing to do is just to super glue the standoff in. Just add the super glue between the Dacron and the fitting. There you go. These are 150 pound lines, 150 pound braking strain lines, and they're about 110 foot long, which is my preferred length of line to fly on with a full size kite like this. One of my lines is marked with a red dash on the sleeving, so I prefer to put this on the right because it's red on the right, it's easy to recognize. And then the lark's head knot is quite straightforward. You take your thumb and forefinger in the loop on the line spread your fingers and point your elbow to the sky and then pinch your fingers together again creating a loop then you change hands keeping the loop there and then all you do is pass your bridle point through the loop and pull the loop on the line tight and that's it so there's two ways to do this either wind the lines out from the handle where you'd use a ground stake and then attach the kite once you've wound the lines out. Or you have the lines wound the other way where you attach the kite first, which is how I prefer to do it. It's a bit lazier, it's a bit quicker as well. And also if you're not scared of things tangling up or snagging up when the kite might get into a problem position on the ground here, that's okay. So if you're willing to work a little bit more um, in terms of walking down to, the, down to the kite, if it messes up, that's okay. I'm going to put the kite on its face, but with the lines over the back of the kite. So the kite won't launch, but what it means is I've got to do some groundwork to recover the kite. And that's it. They've rolled off the winder. I'll put my winder in my pocket, just to untwist the lines. Theoretically, they shouldn't have any twist in at all. Put my hands up through the bottom of the strap and then over the top. And that's the most comfortable way of flying. So now the kite is on its front, but I'm just going to pull quite hard and that will turn the kite over, like so. A basic takeoff technique, hands out in front of you, shoulders relaxed, take a couple of steps backwards and swing your arms down by your hips to behind you. Here we go. That's it. Most frequently asked question, how do you land a kite downwind in strong wind and how do you do a tip stand? They're basically the same thing. What I would say the easiest thing to do is, is to come down the window and do a stall, which is that. But as you come down, turn the kite around and step forwards. And it's a careful balance between walking forwards and the flick of the wrist to get the kite to rotate. So again, almost like doing a square corner, it's a push turn, but I step forward and let both my hands go forwards as well to, if you like, punch the air out of the sail so the kite stops and just hovers in the sky. If you keep doing this, coming down and doing a stall, if you can get it stable, great. And then what you do is bring it further into the centre of the window and bring it lower 
and keep doing that, keep repeating it, keep coming lower and lower, and eventually you get to the ground there, so it becomes a landing. It's exactly the same thing, it's just a stall, but the ground gets in the way. And then your timing gets good, and then you get the tip stand. The top line's further forwards. I'm slightly leaning into it as well, which seems to be a natural body position to be in. But the kite's leaning back at about 45 degrees and my left hand is further forwards. But you'll notice that the top line's staying fairly steady and the bottom line's doing all the forwards and backwards movement just to keep the kite under control. So if I pull, it raises the kite. If I push, that was too much by the way, I'll go back into the tip stand. There. And by pulling it, raises the kite. By pushing it, drops it back down. So you can kind of do a bit of a wave now and again when the wind allows it. This time I'm on the other side of the wind window where the kite's pointing to my left. So my left hand is further, further towards me and that hand's doing the controlling now. And I've got my fingers through the string loops in the front of the straps so that I can be a bit more in touch with the kite so yeah gain that sensitivity rather than just holding the webbing which is even better than holding handles those plastic handles that are pretty horrible to use if I've got my fingers through the front then I feel a bit more connected to it so I can feel a little amount of tension on the on the line and kind of just adjust it by almost just pulling my fingers in it feels like. But again in a tip stand I've got the top line further forwards and just altering the bottom line. So just to recap what we do is fly straight towards the ground with power, flick the kite round, that wingtip goes into the ground and then straight away you keep the bottom line steady the top line goes back, so my left hand goes towards the kite and there's about six inches to a foot difference between my two hands. And then the bottom line does all the controlling to keep the kite there. And you can stay there for 10 minutes sometimes, but to incorporate that into a routine or to part of the sequence of flying maneuvers is great. Then from there, you can do all sorts of things like axle takeoffs. And you can start controlling the kite in different types of stalls. This is just a wingtip drag. This is really delicate, it takes a lot of concentration, it needs to be really slow, and the kite's halfway between flying and crashing. But there we go. Because this is a very light kite, it's a super ultra light kite with eight gram spars in it, in a wind of about five miles an hour at the moment. It's gonna have quite a bit of power, so it means that I've got more control so I can get speed on it and also knock the speed off. Makes it a bit more playful. Momentum's not there in axles, but this kite's designed to do quite a few tricks that don't really require the kite to be forced around. The kite will actually do them quite easily, just with a very small amount of encouragement. And this is called a 360, where you run away from the kite, but the kite's pointing towards the back of you, and you run forwards away from the kite. So effectively, you're pulling it around in a circle, creating your own wind. Most trick kites come with a trick line, and these are for when the kite's uh, in, a, in its uncontrolled controllability state. And when the kite goes on its back in a turtle like this, what happens is that the lines hit the trick line so it becomes easier to recover. It's the same with the kite pointing downwards. As the kite comes down the wind window and you throw your hands forward, the kite flattens out. When the kite doesn't have its trick line on, it will act slightly differently when it's doing tricks. So when you uh, belly the kite out, or throw your hands forward, I should say, the difference is that the kite uh, rotates around the 
bottom crossbreaders now without the trick line on. So the point of rotation is much further inside the kite. If you were flying towards the ground and threw your hands forward, then the kite will rotate around the bottom cross spreader again and it will rotate even further. And if, you, do, if uh, you rotate too far, then the kite will go backwards effectively. So you'll see the whole back of the kite and it might make some interesting manoeuvres and tricks can be possible from this point, um, but sometimes it's not desirable. A comet is like a, an axle interrupted with another axle, interrupted with another axle and they're all in the same direction, but one of them's done at about 45 degrees on the exit of the first one. And it has this kind of motion, it's like a rolling motion, and it rolls down the window, but the faster you go, the more it picks up speed. So it's a bit like a snowball in that sense. Now there's very little wind, so I can take advantage of that, let the kite fall down and then go into a fade and what we'll do is get that to climb just by walking backwards. The easy way to come out of a fade is just to yank one line and the kite will spin around halfway and then come flying out. It will recover by itself effectively. So it's not as hard as it looks. Kites now are coming out with yo-yo stoppers on and these are little fittings up the leading edge which allow you to wrap the lines around the kite and then fly the kite on normally and then unwrap the kite again. It sounds a bit complicated, but this is the action. First of all, you'll do a, a flick flat type maneuver, but it's very subtle. And then the kite will rotate 360 degrees, almost around the bottom cross spreader. And then the lines will get caught on the yo-yo stoppers. and then to unwrap it, throw your hands back a little bit and then forwards and the whole kite comes banging out and flies off normally again. Still on yo-yo stoppers, there's plenty of tricks you can do and the yo-yo stoppers help because they'll help to hold the lines when the kite's wrapped up. This is in a fade position where the lines are laid on top of the kite and what you can do is simply just step forward a little bit to rock the kite that way and then pull very sharply on both lines equally to spin the whole kite around to then end up in the yo-yo stoppers and flying around but starting off pointing down. You can fly around normally like this then. Then to come out, one of the ways to come out would be to do a flick flack. So you belly the kite out and then rotate the kite round slightly more than 360 degrees and out it comes. Jacob's ladder is when you put the kite in a fade, do half a backspin and pop on both lines so you give a quick tug to both lines as if you do a yo-yo to then get it to rotate around the bottom cross spreader and go into a turtle where the kite's on its back with its belly up, tail towards you. And then you pull on another line to pull it around back into a fade. So you do a kind of repeated motion. I'm just gonna show you a little bit about bridle adjustment. Most kites have a three-point bridle or even a turbo bridle, which is a little bit more complicated. But to grasp the basics of it, I've got a mark here on the bridle which the kite comes set to. This is just a demonstration, but what I've done is taken off the lark's head just to explain the tension on the kite. So by moving the bridle point down towards the tail, it alters the attitude of the kite so the nose goes away from the flyer and the tail goes towards the flyer, making the kite pull more and making it more accurate and more twitchy, more sensitive. Moving the bridle towards the nose of the kite so effectively lengthening the bottom bridle line and shortening the top bridle line to the leading edge means that the kite will create more lift or find more lift in light wind and it will also have less pull in strong wind. It makes it slightly more docile but is very comfortable to fly. To pack the kite away, 
simply do everything in reverse. So just detach the standoffs from the bottom cross spreader and take out the bottom cross spreader itself. Now the good thing to do with this, to do, to do when you're doing this, is to put your hand underneath the spar, in between the spar and the sail, so that when the spar comes out, it doesn't spring back and pierce the sail. And this applies to when you put the pipe together as well. So you just do the same, my hand's underneath the, the spar protecting it from the sail. And then what you do is turn all the fittings upwards so that when you put the kite, when you fold the kite up, all the pointy parts are pointing outwards and away and they're not pointing back into the kite when you roll it up. Simply take the cross spreaders, lay them along the leading edge and put the standoffs inside the folded kite so they're tucked away. So you've got all the pointed um, spars effectively lying parallel together and then just roll the kite up underneath the spars so there's nothing there that can pierce or damage the kite if you press on it quite hard. I think what most people will do and what we do is listen to lots and lots of music but find something that you like that you could probably hear hundreds of times and not get bored of it, um, but also something you think that other people will like as well because you're putting on a performance in the arena. As well as you liking the music, it also has to have the qualities that you need to uh, write good manoeuvres, to do a good ballet routine to. Um, so it needs a good um, dynamic, we call it. So it has kind of variation in it and it may start quietly and then build up towards the end or have peaks and troughs. The other hardest part is actually coming up with the manoeuvres. Some people design the manoeuvres for the music and what we tended to do was um, come up with a fair few manoeuvres that we wanted to put in somewhere in the, in the ballet section, um, choreographing it and then altering the manoeuvres to fit the music but then the rest of the routine would be um, working out new manoeuvres that fit the music and ways into and out of that. So the other thing that we do is draw a kind of a dynamic map, if you like, which is what mm -hmm. we call it. So um, you can kind of plot on graph paper almost, or just, or just literally draw on a piece of paper and the kind of timeline of the track and then uh, the dynamic of the track is kind of the intensity of it. Right, so, so we have like up. jaggly bits where the music's yeah. angular square bits or smooth. Yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. And, and the, the most and the... intense bit would be the peak. Right, I and see. the quietest, most ambient bit would be the right. so it flat kind of shows line at the you bottom. The, uh, the terrain of the music. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Once we've got the routine as we like it, and it's not polished, but we, we know it, we can fly it from start to finish, um, <clears throat> it starts to get translated into drawings like this, where you've got the direction and the timings on the page, and that becomes very difficult to fly, but with more practice you're able to do it in the extremes of conditions like really light wind like today. And what we might also do is go out and fly those, just those manoeuvres and repeat them to sort out exactly uh, how long they last for straight lines and things yeah. like this, especially when we're working to music with beats in it because that's what we tend to go for. Um, so there's a kind of definitive four beats to a bar typically with our choice of music these days. Once you've got into the competition arena then um, you'll have done all this background work and you'll have a routine that you can notate and everybody can refer to that'll be quite um, neat and very clear to everybody as well. Nobody will have any problems with knowing which bit is which and how to refer to a certain part and so on. And the extent to which we did that with kind of Carl's computer skills is to do it like this, which is a compressed version of this kind of thing. So the same manoeuvre, I think, yeah, we've got the same manoeuvre here as we have here and so on. But this is the kind of, this is the manoeuvres in their kind of entirety, if you like. And then this one is kind of slightly compressed um, to the way we would write it to explain it to each other. So we both know what's going on um, uh, before Carl did this. And then that becomes the kind of um, thing that we can carry around with us and talk about very specific bits and beats and things like this. So it all makes life easier because the other thing about doing competitions is the pressure that's around um, and the 
that can translate to um, certainly tension between you know, the team members or pair members. Um, and really good communication is um, a real key thing. Do you ever unwrite stuff? You know, yeah. scrap oh, yeah, a bit all the time. Yeah, take all the half time. the routine apart yeah. and rewrite it. And uh, yeah, I suppose yeah. some of your routines evolve over years, don't mm. they? They yeah. evolve. Yeah, they evolve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get it. <laughs> just to sort of up the stakes a little bit in order to um, make us focus a bit more, we just say, OK, the judges are behind us and treat that as a real situation. Um, it's a bit like when you stick practicing, it's about visualizations. Stick practice, quite simply, it's a spa with a little model kite on the end. This is vital for visualizing routines and also for practicing. It's very good for choreography, for getting the kite to move with the music. You can get a lot of the bulk of the work done with just something as simple as this. This takes quite a bit of practice to fly one of these things and it looks very strange when you stick practice out on a field when there are people watching. Tell me about what happens when it goes wrong because you guys seem to, if it does go wrong, you seem to cover it up so well. well is that just because you know each other so well? And it is and it's also to do with practicing. Well, when, you, when, we, when, when we used to practice a lot, we used to practice even with mistakes in. So you say, right. you know, at ty times you sort of feel like confident enough to do a whole a set of whole routines if you like so we go okay we'll, we'll do something like five routines and see how it feels and we won't stop mm -hmm. from the start of the music till the, till the end of the music no matter what goes wrong we'll find a way of dealing with it even yeah. if one kites down you have to still walk down pick it up mm -hmm. and do you know recover it yourself yeah. Back in, yeah. so it's good practice for real life yeah exactly. but then also just messing around um you know out the side of a field you know just flying for your own pleasure you work at, you know you start to improvise and that kind of thing so you can work out how to recover a kite when it's on the ground yeah. and all that so it's just experimenting yeah. and then bringing that knowledge into the arena mm. and, and I guess the other thing is just keeping a cool head that's all because yeah. I mean you know like Carl was saying if you're off to the side of the arena and doing it by yourself <clears throat> uh, then you know exactly what to do but of course you're under so much pressure if you're being watched and you're you know or you're being scored for it. Another important thing about doing lots of practice is that you can predict what um, your teammates or your pair partner or whoever is going to do in a certain situation. So say something goes wrong or they miss a beat or you miss a beat or something like that. Um, if you practiced it enough, you, you're likely have to have experienced that at some point. Therefore, you can anticipate what they're going to do or you can have a conversation about it even, you know, in the middle of the competition because you know the terminology, you know you've got names for all the manoeuvres and so you can clearly identify where you are mm. and pick up the pieces really. And also the getting out of that accident as well, the other three are flying um, but one person's down, there'll be a, um, a practiced way of getting, the, getting back into the routine so um, it'll either be a follow, like a fall in, so everybody follows the, the first person and then there'll, there'll be a gap left when they do a ground pass for that person who's on the ground to hop back into, into line and then you, you go into a um, a recognised part of the routine where you can just drop back into it because you practice the routine in sections as well as as a whole so you can go back in from you know, such and such a burst and then the whole routine flows from that point and um, that would work particularly with precision I think but then in a would. ballet competition I'm sure uh, you or I or in a, a team I think the thing to do is for the others to keep flying to the music absolutely and also by practicing out on the field and saying that your judges are behind you or you know, marking out, you know, four corners of an imaginary arena, for instance, so you stay within a certain spot. I mean, just putting a ground stake down on the ground, um, when you start, by the time you finish, that will tell you how, how far you've moved. A very small point, and this relates to teams and pairs, when you're flying together and the, um, the higher the standard you want to, to attain, the more accurate the bridle adjustments need to be. And to get each kite to fly exactly the same, they need to be flown together. The way to test this is to fly a simple ground pass and flank up. So you follow each other and then turn up together, synchronised, and nobody adjusts forwards or backwards uh, to compensate for a kite that's either flying too high or too low or too fast or too slow. If the kite flies too high or too fast, then move the bridle point down towards the tail and if the kite flies too low or too slow, then move the bridle point up 
you can write a routine but then you have to go through it and be quite critical and say well this point here we're going to be far too um, far too far up the up, up towards the back of the field so um, we better change this bit for this reason so that we can actually make up some ground and so on so you're working in all these different scenarios mm -hmm. as you're doing it as well um, and that goes with things like the lines twisting up so they're wrapping up you work that into the routine so you can do it and then you can come out again in a different manoeuvre if you just do loops up for instance which is just a basic side by side loop as a pair um, then if you do something which you get a wrap in like that but then by doing some different types of circles as well. So it's not about just doing a circle, it's about doing varieties of the mm. same thing. Um, and also then interspersing those with something different as well. So either putting an axle in at some point just to carry on, or um, you know getting the kite to change direction as well. So you have kites that go together and then change direction and so on. This is right at the end of the routine where we both go around and we do a, a radar or a donut. Um, it's a speed control thing where the outside kite travels faster to go around the outside. But then we're changing direction so you've got very fast turns and it also seems to wrap the lines up as well. So you've got one maneuver that could be very straightforward but what this does is then make it more complex and then it adds a bit more of complexity on top of it. And that seems to be the case with a lot of um, the maneuvers that we do. For instance, this one, you've got one kite traveling on a few of the beats and you've got the other kite traveling on quite a strange beat pattern so one thing that we experimented with and i think worked well in this routine is that there were parts where um one kite described say a kind of almost an ambient section okay. a kind of string section which is right here um so in the music is um lots of layers but we decided to pick out two here one being the beats and the other being a kind of a string or an ambient kind of long drawn out note and they kind of go together and then there'll be a slight pause and the note will go again or it'll change slightly so I think it goes down and it drops so we're hopefully changing retention from one to the other and maybe even getting the kites mixed up because one's doing squares the other's doing loops then it flips and they go in the other direction so it's a combination of different things and doing asymmetric stuff so it's not always both kites doing the same thing which we really wanted to include in this mm. routine um, and worked well with lots of manoeuvres that we did, I think. One thing that we had a question for at the beginning of writing this was how we're going to make two kites look as interesting as four kites, for instance. So that was the reason for doing, not just all doing, both kites doing all the same manoeuvres together so that they're just mirroring each other all the time or doing, um, you know, parallel stuff. It's about one kite picking out one line in the music and another kite picking out another, but then coming together to do something which is on maybe a different line of music, but both kites travel together. So they um, have this relationship, if you like, so that they come together and they're, they're quite synchronized, but they're, then they split off and do different things. One little thing as well is, especially if you're flying team, um, if you're flying team, what you can do is use the three or four or five kites to pick out each one picks out an individual beat so you can turn on all the beats so say you've got four kites um, and you've got a you know a four beat then the first kite can turn on the first beat second on the second and so on and what that means is that each flyer only turns once but the whole team is its um, entity turns on all the beats all the time OK, air brakes help slow the kite down for strong wind. They take away some of the pull, but they also take, some away, take away some of the speed. These are Warpad air brakes, and they fit inside the frame like this. This is a nappy air brake, which fits on the line in front of the kite like this. Heavier line is better for strong wind because it helps to drag the kite back, acting like an air brake. So we've flown on 55 mile an hour winds using 500 pound lines, two air brakes and one vent super vented kite each and we've survived and been able to fly routines. In terms of psyching other teams out and that kind of psychology, we, um, we employed that to quite a large extent in terms of A, when we're practicing, um, we tended to walk in front of any other teams or pairs that were practicing. So 
we're therefore just focused on our kite and everyone else has to watch us fly, which means that they're keeping an eye on us and they're distracted um, and we're not because there's only our kites in front of us. So that's another thing. And also being always appearing tight together as a unit is really important because you seem or people perceive you as a very together and very focused kind of entity if you do that. So that's about being seen together, always talking, keeping on the same mental wavelength, keep checking that the other one's okay. And the image that that gives off is one of unity and focus. And that's, that's very useful because it makes other teams and pairs think, oh God, they're really together. They're really kind of um, zoned in on what they're doing. And that all helps. So it is a kind of aggressive thing, the competition side of things in a psychological way, but it's all part of it. It's the same as any other sport, I think. So it's fair game to um, gently try and kind of uh, disrupt the uh, thought patterns of your competitors, not in a very, um, not in a nasty way, just in a way that um, gives them a sense of fear because anything you can do to help is worth doing, I think. We used to fly um, most Saturdays and most Sundays and not really get a weekend off except for um, Christmas, for instance. So during the summer you're at competitions and you're practicing hard before the competition, then you do the competition. Um, so you quite, you've done quite a few routines each day for, for the practice and the competition and then that's all the way through the summer and then by the time winter comes that's a good time to come up with a new routine where it's out of the season. Team flying is great and it's really easy to get into. All you need is four kites or however many kites and flyers just to set up the team and matching line sets. The basic thing to think about is that team flying is made up of circles and squares and it's threads and straight lines and so on. So all it is is just a, a series of patterns and that's what you're doing is pattern making in the sky. So do lots of interesting stuff that is based on that and then people will like it, you'll enjoy flying to it and you'll have a great time. Great. Right. 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 
big. Turn. And axle. Pull. And brake. Brake. And now. 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 Brake. Brake. Turn. Turn. Flying Techniques has been a year in the making. The first email was exchanged in late January 2003 and by March we were doing the first bit of filming which was on Blackheath with Carl. We came across the airbow at the Weymouth International Beach Kite Festival and up until that point the airbow wasn't actually going to be part of Flying Techniques. We didn't really know much about it. After we saw it in action, we just knew that it had to be in there. So the first bit of filming with the airbow, the proper filming, was done at the May Middle Wallop. And that one was a particularly difficult time for me because that morning I'd come down with bad toothache. And so for the whole of the filming session, I was trying to keep my mind focused on actually filming the airbow and forgetting about the toothache. The August... Middle Wallop was also another notable event because that's the weekend where the temperatures in the UK reached the highest ever recorded at 38 degrees centigrade. That was a killer weekend as anybody who was there can well remember. On the Sunday morning there was no wind and so Andy went through the setting up of fresh lines and assembling the airbow and assembling the Gemini. Okay. At midday, Carl, James and I headed off into the middle of the field with okay, a large so umbrella and, music, and plenty of water. That you like, that you think and that's where we recorded the interview times. about team flying and, go over it and, go and over punctuated it. it with an opportunity for the guys to then get out of the sun and sit under the umbrella and drink lots of lukewarm water. In the afternoon, thankfully, the wind picked up and Carl and James went through their, the routine that we've got on the DVD. They went through that four times without any music. Absolutely fantastic. James was also proving very popular during the year as he had another film crew following them around. So we had to work with those and make sure that we didn't get into each other's shots. Keen viewers will notice that when James is flying the red, he has sleeving on his lines, even though James doesn't normally fly with sleeving on his lines. And that's because at one of the Blackheath filming sessions, there was a problem with his lines. So we had to improvise and use some lines that we had with us. You can also see that on his arms, he's got uh, rather large graze marks, and that's because a couple of days before he came to do the filming, he suffered a wipeout on his mountain board and uh, was a bit black and blue. Most of my time at kite festivals was spent filming, but occasionally I did manage to get involved with kite flying. In the end, I shot about 840, 900 minutes of footage. It's been a lot of fun to do this video project. It's certainly been one of the most involved video projects that I've ever done. But I've also learned a lot. I've learned a lot about kite flying, and I think others will learn a lot from this as well. So all that's left for me to do is to thank Andy, Carl and James for all the effort that they've put in. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to Helen. Congratulations, you found the Easter egg. So we just got to get that in our heads now and do it like it's just completely natural. Yeah. Ready? Oh, hi. I'm Andy Wardley. Welcome to Flying... Oh, that was really crass. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi, there's a camera there. I didn't hi. see it. Never fly near other kites. Each, each person with, the, with each person. No, no, with each person. With each person, with each person, and we'll keep going like that. Oh, no, it's broken. Guy, let's go rescue it. Help, help, help. Come on, you're all right, laddie. Up you get. Come on, you can do it. You can do it, go on up your cat. Up your cat, go on. Thank you.
Well, I'll use my other ear now. Hello. Hello. Where's he gone? Where's he gone? Hello. Hi, I'm Andy Wardley. Hi, I'm James Robertshaw. Hello, I'm Carl Robertshaw. Failed again. Yeah, I'm on your head, I'm on your head. <laughs> expert, call me an expert. And wind the lines down to the kite. Except the kite's a long way away. Oh, it's pulling like a truck! I'm Andy Wardley, and you may know me from such flying videos. <laughs> Activator. And it, and it, it allows some of the. Oh, the, the super glue simply sits. Action. 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 Yeah, see, first hand, second hand, axle pop. Hi, I'm Andy Wardley. Welcome to Flying Techniques. Welcome, Welcome to, to Flying Techniques. <laughs> 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 Congratulations, you found the other Easter egg. Ha, 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 ha.